Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this, the second of our live Ali House events for Tokyo 2020. I uh, hope you enjoyed those great sounds of the 60s, and which uh, hopefully have put you in the mood for this uh, next hour or so when we have our live chat with the 1964 Olympians, those who took part in the, in the Tokyo Games. Now, in 1964, I was uh, nine years old and I remember watching on my very small black and white TV set those pictures from right across the world. I was living in the, in the US then um, from the, what was then a, uh, a country that I barely knew about, Japan. Um, and seeing those pictures live um, was a really exciting experience. Um, I'm sure it was even more exciting actually taking part um, for those Olympians. We've got uh, six extraordinary people with us today um, and guiding us through uh, the next hour or so is journalist Roy Tamazawa, who literally wrote the book on the, uh, on the 1964 Olympic Games. Um, before I introduce you to Roy, uh, just a quick mention for those of you who are Olympians, don't forget to go to olympians.org and leave your mark. Over 1,200 Olympians have so far shown their support for those who have been organizing and competing in the Games. Um, and also you can see all of our other Ollie House activities if you go to our website. So I'm really looking forward to this. I know there's some really fascinating and interesting stories you'll be hearing over the next hour or so. So I'd like to hand over to you, Roy, take it away. Thank you, Mike and the WOA. Very groovy opening music, Mike. And hello to everyone listening. On October 10th, 1964, Japan welcomed the world to the first Olympic games in Asia, welcoming 6,348 foreign athletes. Only 19 years after the end of the Second World War, which left Tokyo in rubble, visiting Olympians were pleasantly surprised to see a modern, high-tech country to experience a games run precisely and efficiently, and to interact with the Japanese people whose graciousness and helpfulness went above and beyond. The 1964 Tokyo Olympics were the first ever Olympic Games to be broadcast live around the world via satellite and were seen by up to 800 million people on every continent. I'm truly honored to be joined by six great Olympians, participants at the 18th Olympiad in Japan. I've been fortunate to interview all of them in the past. Now, while I truly wish we could have done this in person in Tokyo, I am still so happy to share their stories with you all online. Let me introduce our very special guests. Let's start with Jim Bregman. Jim was a member of the first US team to compete in judo at the Olympic games and the only American to medal in the sport at Tokyo in 1964, winning bronze in the under 80 kilogram category. Hi, Jim. Hi, it's nice to be here. And uh, I also am sorry we can't do this in person. I'd love to be back in Tokyo. One day. One next, day. <laughs> next, it's Marie's Chamberlain. Marie's only Olympic appearance took place at Tokyo in 1964, where she won bronze for New Zealand in the 800 meter sprint. Now she remains the only New Zealand woman to have won an Olympic track medal. Hi, Marie's. You may want to unmute yourself. There you go. Oh, one more time, one more time. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be. It's great to have you. So now let's say hello to Roger Jackson. Roger represented Canada in rowing at Tokyo 1964, winning Canada's only gold medal of the games alongside partner George Hungerford in the Coxless pair. Uh, Roger competed in two more Olympic games after Tokyo as well. Hello. Thanks for good to see inviting you. me to be part of this. We're very happy to have you, Roger. Next up is Ada Kok. Ada is a double Olympian who competed for the Netherlands in swimming 
at the Tokyo 1964 and Mexico City 1968 Olympic Games. And at her first games in Tokyo at just 17 years of age, Ada won silver in both the 100 meter butterfly and four by 100 meter medley relay. Very late evening for you, but thank you for coming, Ada. Thank you very much. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. <laughs> for it's me, great to have evening. you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Now, let's welcome Mel Pender. Mel thank is you. Great to see you, Mel. Mel is a two-time Olympic sprinter from the 1964 Tokyo and 68 Mexico City Games. Uh, he did compete in the 100 meter finals in 1964, uh, and he won gold in 1968 as part of the USA's four by 100 meter relay team in world record time. Hi, Mel. Hi, hi, it's great. It's great to be here. I just wish I could be in Tokyo right now. Uh, yes, I wish you were here too. <laughs> and finally, an Olympian from Japan, uh, Yojiro Uetake. Yojiro is a double Olympic Hello. champion. Hi, ohayou gozaimasu. <laughs> uh, Yojiro won uh, both. Ohayou gozaimasu. Very ohayou proud to be here. Thank you. It's great to have you. Uh, just, just so everyone knows, Yojiro-san won gold in freestyle bantamweight wrestling for Japan at both the 1964 and 1960 eight Olympic Games. So we're looking forward to hearing all your great stories uh, as we progress during the evening, morning, afternoon. So I'm going to kick it off with uh, questions. Um, so I'd like to take us back in time. It's the 1960s. Uh, it's the decade of space pioneers and bullet trains. Um, the British invasion of rock and roll, uh, the rise of television and consumerism, uh, a consistently high global GDP, as well as an increase in social activism. But we're going to focus on Japan. In fact, some of you had been to Japan, and some of you were coming to Japan for the first time. Maurice, I want to ask you the first question. You didn't know anyone in Japan. In fact, you had very limited experience in traveling internationally, and, and yet you seem to have made a lot of friends in Japan quickly. Can you tell us about that? Yes, well, I only knew that Japan and New Zealand were islands and that we were seismic activity, and, and you had a lot of people. In fact, all your population, uh, the population of Tokyo, New Zealand would have gone in, into it three times back then. <laughs> And, and even now, we, we would be the same. So it was very overwhelming to experience coming into Japan and having this multitude of people and then learning to meet these people. But uh, I found in the village, am I allowed to say things about in the village? Sure, no? please do. <laughs> when we, when uh, our team arrived in the compound because of the women and the men were separated, and we were in a block where we shared th three to a room or four to a room and the bathroom facilities we shared with about half a dozen other nations. And the women who came to uh, clean the rooms and look after us only spoke Japanese. And so the New Zealand uh, Association had given us Japanese dictionaries. And so every day I would practice a sentence to say in Japanese to try and integrate with these people. And of course, they were so thrilled, they would clap their hands and laugh and come running to me at the bed. And then I then they'd all speak in Japanese. And of course, I couldn't understand a word. And I'd lost everything that I was trying to say. But I practiced this every day. And every day, they came and gave me things like these things that I'm showing you now, little wow. little ornamentation things. And all of these things, they would come and give me, and they were all wrapped up beautifully in boxes with ribbons, all of these beautiful things. And I've got miles more. And <laughs> uh, I was it was only because I felt that Maybe I was trying to talk to them in Japanese, and maybe that's what it was, I don't know. But nevertheless, they followed me all the time when I did anything, and they were very kind toward me. But 
um, on the whole, I found the difference between with the population of New Zealand and uh, Japan quite overwhelming. And one time I had to go to see my brother. He came on the Oriana Alina in Yokohama and I just, he wanted me to go and have a meal. And so I had to go to the railway station and the train was full. And I was with another friend and I thought, well, we must wait for another train. But all of a sudden there was this onrush of people and these men in white coats and gloves and we were shoved in, literally shoved into this train. And I lost her. We, we never met up till we got to Yokohama. And I couldn't only, I could only move my head and I used to have to go backwards and forwards in the train. It was quite scary. <laughs> but nevertheless, I never did ever feel um, nervous in Japan because the people were so kind and helpful. And okay. so uh, that was nice. That's great. Nice. And I'm, I'm, I just, I'm just conscious of time, but I, I, I remember you telling me that story and, and it, it, the Japanese seemed to welcome you. Uh, and I'm wondering if Roger had the same experience, um, because I think Roger was also the first time for you to come to Asia. So what was it like for you? Well, you're absolutely right. It, um, uh, I'd never been to Asia, and uh, this was a, a flight from Vancouver uh, to Narita Airport. And I, my very first impression uh, was this long bus ride from the airport into the city of Tokyo and realizing that the population of Tokyo was the same size as the total population of Canada. And uh, it, was, uh, it was my wake up call to you know, to very large cities and a very brand new experience. I, like Marisa, I was absolutely charmed by the people, by the incredible kindness of the volunteers. I mean, layers upon layers of volunteers at every venue, uh, all of them incredibly wanting to speak or try to speak English or to be of assistance. My greatest fun though was with the children because I'm, obviously was a foreigner, which most children had never seen, I think, 20 years after the war. And I was six foot five inches tall and their heads were at the lower part of my body and they'd run up and laugh and measure their heads against uh, my height, which was great <laughs> fun for us. And then you'd be able to interact. You couldn't speak the language, but you could do all kinds of funny things with them. They were always outside of the village gates uh, we were living in a former U.S. military base, and we'd walk outside, be mobbed by children. And really, maybe the last impression I'll give you was of the quality of the architecture. The sport architecture in Japan was unbelievable. It was a, a complete revolution of how sports stadia should be designed and built. And indeed, as you know, some of those facilities are still very much in use and still extremely uh, unique and marvelous in their design. So it was an impression of something that was way beyond what we had experienced in Canada. Right, thank you. And uh, it, coincidentally, Jim was in one of those brand new That's buildings uh, in the Nippon Budokan, which I think had just opened up a year before, if not that year. So Jim, you were, you were lived in Japan, right? In fact, uh, you lived in Tokyo and part of a community of Japanese and non-Japanese judoka. Um, so you were seeing Japan through a different lens than Maurice and, and Roger. Uh, what, what story do you have for us? Jim, you're on mute. I went to Japan in 1960 after high school to go to university and study the martial art of judo. So uh, the judo community was quite welcoming as was the Japanese population in general. Uh, since I had been doing judo from the time I was 12 years old, I was very familiar with all of the Japanese terminology of the sport and uh, felt very comfortable in the various uh, dojo, which are the practice areas of judo. Uh, I quickly learned how to get around on the uh, train system and the wonderful subway system. Uh, it was easy to go back and forth wherever you wanted to go. Uh, the city was quite accommodating. And I particularly liked the small shops where all up and down the street, 
you could just go in and get soba or sushi or whatever you want. Uh, I noticed uh, currently watching, there were things called skyscrapers. And I don't remember a lot of skyscrapers, but I do remember venues, particularly the Budokan, where I performed the opening ceremony in 1963 with Hayward Nishioka, my forms partner at the Budokan. And the stadium was packed because judo is an indigenous sport. It was founded in Japan by Judo Okano in 1882. It's extremely popular. So by the time we got to the actual games, uh, I knew that this was going to be a very special Olympics. It was extraordinarily well done. Great. Mel, you, you were also in Japan as well. Uh, in Okinawa, in fact, uh, prior to the Olympics. What was that like for you? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I started out in the military. I was stationed in Okinawa with the 82nd Airborne, jumping out of airplanes and getting ready for Vietnam, really. And um, I was asked to run against the Japanese that was training for the 1964 games in Tokyo. And the coach asked me to, the football coach asked me to come out and and run against the Japanese that was uh, that was in Okinawa getting ready for the games in Tokyo. And I had never ran track in my life. And I happened to win, beat the best guy there and and uh, was sent to um, Yokohama for seven days. We call R&R &R, um, in the military for seven days. And, uh, and when I was there, I, I saw all these beautiful structures going up for the Olympic games and not knowing anything about track I said, I'm coming back to Tokyo and I'm gonna run in the Olympic games. And I met so many nice people there. And in fact, I'm gonna say this, you're gonna laugh when I say it, but I fell in love. <laughs> I fell in love in Tokyo. So I had to come back. So I uh, uh, went back and told my buddy, I said, I'm gonna make the Olympic team. And I did, I made the Olympic team in 1964 and I was, was able to, uh, to go back to Tokyo. And when I was in Tokyo, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed the people. I mean, they were so nice and so smart. I, I, never, I thought people were the smartest people in the world. I thought Japanese was geniuses, the way they did things. I mean, the structures were beautiful. Uh, I never seen anything like that. I'm a country boy. And for me to go to Japan, you know, and to see what I was seeing, and for me to be in another a foreign country, it was like being in another world. And I met the Japanese sprinter, which, uh, I really, really enjoyed, you know, meeting him. I couldn't understand his language, but uh, we got to be pretty close. We you know we shake hands and shake our heads and yes and no. And but <laughs> I, I wish I could have got to see him uh, uh, if I came back to Tokyo for Tokyo. If he's still around, I would, would love to have met him, see him again. But it was just amazing how uh, Japanese did things. Uh, they make clothes in, in two days, and I mean, if you want something, you got it in a couple, three or four days. You got it. But I just want to enjoy, I just want to say that Tokyo, I, I just miss being in Tokyo at the games, I tell you. Yeah, well, it's amazing, right? You were in the military, you went to Okinawa, and then you became an Olympian. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Ada, you were an impressionable teenager at 17. What do you remember of your time in Japan? What do I remember of my time? It was just overwhelming. You know what, what most struck me was first of all the traffic and then the temples versus all the skyscrapers, the people, and most of all, you know, what I loved and everybody is nodding and I think they know all know what I'm talking about. It is the, the royal palace, yeah, the Senjoji temple, the Tokinokani temple, the time bell tower. Yeah, and it was the first time ever I saw television, but color television. It was in 1964 when for the first time there was television in color. Just incredible. And then also, like everybody else is saying, you know, Jim and Roger and Marie, the people, they were so friendly, so helpful, so overwhelming. There's no other word I can describe my first uh, actually, my first Olympic Games in, in Tokyo. Just, I loved it from the minute I arrived 
until the last plane I left, you know, to Holland. I really. <laughs> That's wonderful. So Yojiro, Yojiro-san, can you unmute? Can you unmute? There you go. Yeah, so, Yojiro-san. Okay. Yes. You, you are our only yeah. Japanese guest today. And you were born in 1943 before World War II ended. And you witnessed the changes that Japan went through in the 1950s and early 1960s. What was your impression of Japan in 1964? Yes. Um, 1964 was uh, studying at the uh, Oklahoma State University, USA. And I was so at that time, I have to come back to make a team for the tryout 1964. It was uh, September, uh, July, July. Uh, and I made a team. Besides that, I made the uh, uh, final to win the Olympic. But Yojiro san, what, what was it like for the Japanese? Nin 1960 and 19, around 1960, 1970, I was in Japan. Japanese people were truly uh, realized that uh, we are recovered and we are coming back almost 100% from the uh, disaster of the uh, World War II. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Those days, Japan is in a uh, middle of the uh, high economic miracle, miracle growth time. People worked hard and hard those days because if they work hard and hard, we can get better their own living and better their own economies. They work very hard. Everybody looked very happy those days and everybody celebrate and welcome the uh, 1964. Uh, to hold the Tokyo Olympic. Yes. So very. I hope it was, you understand what I, whatever I tried to say. Is we, it? we did. We did. It was a very proud moment Thank for, you, for all the Japanese, uh, and uh, I'm sure they were very proud when when you won your gold medal as well. Um, so I want to talk about biggest memory of the games, and I want to stay yes, with you, right. Yojiro-san. Yojiro right. you, you, you are a wrestling legend, in, not just in the United States and Japan, uh, but also Japan. So for you in, in, the, in the sports, what was your biggest memory? Before you talk to me about uh, people watching your event uh, when your gold medal of Olympic the event. Day. Yes. Memory of the Olympic. Yes. Well, memory of, of uh, side uh, most uh, number one memory of the Olympic was the uh, my father and. Uh, my USA gallant tour. A gallant tour means uh, like uh, USA, uh, my USA parents. Mm. His name, 
Mr. and Mrs. Tom Lumley. Both my father and Tom Lumley, Mr. and Mrs. Tom Lumley, uh, were cheering for me at the front uh, row of the wrestling stadium. When I won the gold medal, I just look at their face. Their happiest smile. And there was the uh, my best memory of the uh, 1964 in Tokyo Olympics. And smile, yeah, smile was so great for me to me. Yeah. That's a yeah. best memory, I think. It's a wonderful memory, yeah. you know. Thought. Happy, felt and very happy. <laughs> I'm glad to, glad to wrestle, you know. And I, I think uh, right. I'm going to move Thank on, you. but uh, it, it also makes it bittersweet to think about Tokyo 2020. Uh, but I'm glad you had that wonderful moment with your parents and your and your family back in the United States. So, so Mel, you know, it's 64, it's somewhat bittersweet for you. Uh, you got injured in 1964, but you came back in 1968 to win gold at uh, Mexico City. Uh, but in 64, you witnessed some of the greatest Olympic moments in history, and you may have a lot of memories. Do you have a story from 64 you can share? Uh, yes, the great Bob Hayes. Yeah. Well, he was uh, the fastest guy in the world, and I was like number two at the time. And as you know, I got hurt uh, and didn't win a medal. I placed six and 100 meters. But he talked about his parents and how the look on their face when he uh, won the gold medal over in, 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 when he, in, in Tokyo. Well, my mother, I promised her one day I was going to do something great with my life. And making the Olympic team coming from my community. I was like the president of the United States <laughs> <laughs> because we didn't have much. And for someone to do something as great as I did in my community, it, my mother thought I was the greatest thing since Cracker Jacks, I'm telling you. <laughs> she, she, she just thought that, you know, that for me to do something like that was, was unusual. Because you know it was back in, in 64 and in, in 19 you know it was, it was still very inter, uh, segregated in 1960, 1964 and and for me to make the, uh, an Olympic team as great as, uh, as the Olympic team is and and to be one of the greatest sprinters in uh, in the world and athletes in the world represent the United States of America was unheard of and that was the thing that was really really uh, happy with me it made me happy was to make her happy and you know I got hurt. And 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 play six, but it, it gave me more more uh, inspiration to do things in my life when I got hurt in Tokyo. For me to make an Olympic team and be one of the fastest guys in the world, and I was 27 years old, and that's one of the oldest sprinters in the history of track and field back then to run as a sprinter. And but I promised myself that I was going to come back in 1968 when I laid on the ground and and a track in Tokyo. I thought it was all over for me. For me to come back at age 31 and win a gold medal was the greatest things that ever happened to me and 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 my mother again because I took her to Mexico. So she was she was so happy and so proud of me and and I was so happy that I could do that for her after the way I you know growing up my neighborhood it wasn't her. If it went for my mother, I think I wouldn't be the person I'm sitting here today and my grandfather. So but I did something great. You know, being black in the United States at that time was something was unheard of in uh, in this country, along with Bob Hayes and, and uh, quite a few other uh, Olympians during that time. Wow. Thank you very much for sharing that. Jim, how about you? You you saw some amazing bouts at the, the Budokan. What was your biggest memory of the 64 Olympics? Well, judo is a very disciplined and respectful sport. And Anton Giesink of Holland was a perennial European champion and was a world champion. Japan had won the first three gold medals in the first three weight categories. 
the last match was for the opened category gold medal. And he was facing Kaminaga of Japan. It was a difficult thing to watch and a wonderful thing to watch at the same time. Anton won the match, threw Kaminaga to the ground and pinned him. When the referee awarded the match to Anton, the very enthusiastic Dutch contingent were so excited with yelling and screaming that they ran and almost got up on the mat area to congratulate Anton. That's just not done. So Anton instantly understood the peril that would have put Kaminaga in as an embarrassment, embarrassed the sport, embarrassed him. So he very quickly took control of the situation waved them back, asked them to go back, relax, and sit down. At that point, Kaminaga was actually stunned. He felt internally that he had let his country down. And there were tears coming out. So Anton, in the very Olympic tradition of mutual welfare and benefit, approached him, reoriented him so that he could bow respectfully and bow out. And then they bowed to the emperor and empress of Japan, I believe. And they maintained the dignity of the sport and Kaminaga maintained his dignity. That was a, a moment of great sadness for the Japanese and great joy for the judo community because the Japanese grip on the sport of judo had been somewhat broken. And in the future, it gave a signal that if other people from other nations work very hard, they could attain the highest quality of judo in the world and compete effectively with the Japanese. So that was a memorable moment to say the least. Uh, one of the biggest of moments of the 64 Tokyo Olympics, definitely. Absolutely. Thank you. Ara, you, you, were, you were not only at the Budokan, you were at the Kenzo Tanga Yoyogi National Gymnasium, where all the swimming and diving events were held. And um, what can you share from your moments? Oh, in the 64? Uh, what Jimmy is referring to is, was such an historic moment. And actually, I said it the other day uh, at the Dutch television, because you know, 64 is 64 for us is Anton Giesing beating Kaminaga. So I said, maybe in Holland, I'm the only one now who are still alive who can tell about it because I was there as well, Jim. And due to the fact that in the Yoyogi, yes, together, huh? together we saw the historic moment, although sad, very sad for the Japanese people and for the Dutch people, it was, of course, a moment of, yes, you know, European as well as other countries can beat judo or the judokas from the different countries from, from Japan. It was a Japanese sport and the Japanese always won. So that was the proof, but to be there, and I watched the audience and I can still have goose pimples. You know, the audience was quiet, so quiet. Maybe you can recall it because I do, I vividly do quiet, quiet, quiet. And I looked around and the people were crying, you yes. know, not sobbing, silent tears, tears rolling down their faces. Absolutely. And it was, it was sad. For us, it was a happy moment and a sad moment as well. And again, you know, I was so lucky to be there due to the fact that being one of the youngest members of the team, I won two silver medals at the Yoyogi, the beautiful Yoyogi Stadium, I mean, swimming in the butterfly and in the relay right. as well. So this is an historic moment, but also First of all, your medals. Due to the medals, I went to another historic moment, Anton, you know, beating Kaminaga. And then they said, well, you can be the flag bearer at the 
closing ceremony. So, wow. so lucky. I am such <laughs> a lucky human being you cannot imagine. You know, and this is, when you say Tokyo, the memories are just overwhelming me, overwhelming. But what you said also about the officials, you know, running on the mat, trying to celebrate and trying to congratulate Anton, they were whistled back by him, you know, I can still see him pointing out to them like, oh no, this is holy ground, you're talking yes. holy ground, and you go out, you know, easily you could have forgotten it, because again, for him to win gold was, yes. but he just stayed in line within you, the holy rules of judo, and the holy rules of this beautiful, beautiful Budokan, with this victory. Absolutely. That is, that is Olympicism, that is stamina, that is all what the Olympic Games are about. You yes. know, afterwards, they both go to the emperor and empress, you're right. But also there was this acknowledgement of together, you know. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ada. Yes. That's great. I, 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 I'm just trying to get to make sure we cover all the great stories because I know, Maurice, uh, you told me a story that amazed me. Uh, you won the bronze medal in the 800 meter race uh, thanks to a competitor. So can you tell us about that? Uh, you're, on, you're on mute, Maurice. You're still on mute. There you go. Yes, I always wanted to be an Olympic medalist. Or, and in New Zealand, I had qualified for Rome and I was the only athlete that had been left behind. And I, for to this day, I have no re reason to know why. And so when it came to Japan, this was my last opportunity that I felt that I wanted to compete in. And conditions in New Zealand are nothing like anywhere else in the world because we were a small population. I had to run on grounds that really are rugby fields. And we had, everything is outside. We had no facilities at all that could put you in, uh, be able to compete properly at an Olympic Games. And in the dark, always in the dark, because it was winter time in New Zealand. And I hadn't raced since March, where I had beaten the world record holder, Dixie Willis in Australia and I was number two in the world. And so I didn't race again till October. The 18th was my first heat. So I had all that long time of no racing, but just winter training in the dark on getting up at six in the morning, going to work and then running again at night, waiting for trains to go through to the port to light up the ground to see where I was with my coach in frosts, hard frost fogs. It was unbelievable now when I think about it. We landed in Japan and it was so overpowering. The stadium was out of this world and we had trained in uh, facilities that uh, Arthur Lydiard had taken us to. And to actually put your feet on a cinder track, it was like I was dancing. It was <laughs> wonderful. Well, when the, the first heat came, um, I knew only one person, and that was Dixie Willis, the world record holder from Australia. I never knew any other European runner, and I'd never raced with anybody because we were so far removed in New Zealand. I always had to run against the clock. And so consequently, when, it, when I was sitting waiting for my heat to be called, I thought, well, I wonder how Dixie's getting on because she was in the heat before me. And then I saw her walk through the door and she looked around and she came straight to me. She was very distressed. And she said, I said, how did you get on? She said, I didn't get on. I'm not running. I can't handle the pressure. And I hope you win, Maurice. Well, I was floored. And I thought, she's been to games before. It seemed incredible to me. So anyway, I went down and I, it was pouring with rain on, in the morning. And uh, I'm, I don't really like running in rain. <laughs> and, and the cinder track. Uh, the red of the cinder track, unbeknown to me, all covered me all over. I came in second. And the French 
athlete turned around and burst out laughing at me. I thought she was going to shake my hand, but she didn't. She just burst out laughing. I went into the bathroom and I looked at myself and I looked like a red Martian. So no wonder she laughed. The next day was uh, the because the, we ran three days in a row. There was no break in between like there is today. And that was in the afternoon, the semi-final. And my coach had told me that I would find it very difficult to run race, go from winter training to race. And I would come right about 500 meters, I would feel better. And I, I sort of did feel I went into another gear and I did feel better, but it was still hard work trying to get the legs to race. In the heat, uh, the semi-final, um, I, it was in the afternoon, it was a lovely afternoon and warm, and it suited me. And I, I found that race more comfortable. In fact, that was the better race of everything for me. And I, I had no idea how to run because I'd never raced with any of these people. And I just knew you had to go at some part at the end. And so 100 meters to go, I just sort of saw a gap and I just sprinted up the straight. And I won that easily. And then when I went back to the village, I went back to get some sort of massage because we never had doctors or anything with our team. And so one of the boys was a masseuse. So he massaged my legs for me. And then I had a lot of pressure from some of the New Zealand athletes because they said that the whole country expected that I should win now. That was the worst thing to have said to me. I became very nervous, ran that race a hundred times through the night, got up in the morning for the race in the afternoon, the final, feeling like a piece of lead. And when I went to the stadium, um, I really, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was so weak. I didn't know how I was going to run. And the race, when we went down to the start of the race, I was in lane seven and the two British athletes were either side of me. And uh, I'd always heard about this um, red and heard about how people uh, played sort of psychological games with athletes and then the British started because the track was so close to the people they were just up above and you could hear every word they said and they were calling down to, to encourage their people but then they started to be quite verbally nasty to me and I thought, why are you being like that? Because I, I don't really know you. And I, anyway, I thought it's a waste of time. I'm weak anyway from my own countrymen. And when the race started, I, I just ran automatic. I, had, I just had no feeling. And for 100 meters, I, I just ran and then came across. And I noted that the two British, I was at the back and I noted the two British girls stayed behind me. We'd no sooner gone about, 10 yards and I felt this almighty jab right into my chest from the German girl. She knocked me complete, winded me completely and I lost balance. And you wouldn't believe this, but two sets of hands behind me, which were the British, grabbed hold of my singlet and pulled me back onto the track. And so once more, they righted me and once more, I was able to continue running. I was utterly stunned. And I continued right round. And I knew the first lap was world-class time because I was used to running on my own. And when we got right round again to nearly uh, the 500 meter mark, I was still in this reverie. And then all of a sudden, the stadium started to call black, black, black. And I thought, that's me. I'm, I'm black. I'm the only New Zealand person here. And it woke me up. I thought, fancy the Japanese people calling out for me. It was, oh, I couldn't believe it. And I, because I was so inexperienced runner, I just took off at the 200 meter mark and ran three, three laps, you know, like uh, round, which was the most ridiculous thing to have done. And little did I know that I was being pulling Ann Packer behind me because she said at the end of the, um, uh, meeting that they I was the one that they wanted in the race because I was the one that was going to win as far as they were concerned and she knew she could beat me if she ran up the straight and when I came up into the straight I was lying second and I'd taken it had taken so much out of me I could see the French girl in front and I thought I just I don't think I can get to you and then Anne just went past me and I thought no I could have cried 
And, and I looked around to see where I was and I could see that I was in a comfortable third. I knew I couldn't make it anymore. And so that's how it ended. And Anne told me did, at the um, news uh, conference, did I feel those hands pull, pull me back up? And I said, yes, I did. She said, they were, that wasn't us. She said, we needed you there for me to win. Well, then when uh, we stood on the dais and I was the third one because I was bronze, um, the whole impact of what I had been through to get to these games, all those 12 years of slog in conditions that uh, a lot of Europeans would never know about. And, and it, it just flooded over me and I broke down and wept. And I thought of all those wet, cold nights, <laughs> lonely nights. And then Anne touched me on the shoulder and she said, Lord, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, was waiting to give me the medal. And he said to me, don't worry, my dear, I'm enjoying that. Just take your time. Then when I went back to the village uh, here, it was unbelievable. In the village were all of these Japanese people, all the people who worked in that part where I was, they were all lined up either side, clapping and calling and crying for me. And I was overwhelmed. And then they said, Chamberlain's son, we wanted you to win. We were crying, we were calling, but Chamberlain's son, you too elegant lady to be running on track. And I said, it, it was so, I was so moved and overwhelmed by these beautiful people. I sat down on the seat and I cried. I thought it was a culmination of their kindness, the fact that I had got something out of that mess. And so that was my most wonderful moment. Maurice, thank you so much. And I know Mike, <laughs> that was such a wonderful story. So we, Roger, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it the baton to you. Uh, it's a tough act to follow uh but because uh, her story had everything uh but tell us about uh your biggest moment memory well i've got i've got a prop this is a pear or rowing shell and you can get the impression of two rowers my partner george hungerford and i we didn't have one of these uh in our club to send over to tokyo uh, in 1964, I was training in the in Vancouver on the on the Vancouver Harbor. Uh, the only competitions like Maurice that we had were the neighbors to the south in Seattle. It was the only opportunity to get international competition. Um, and so when we were selected to row the pair or in Tokyo, we had to borrow a boat. So we went to the University of Washington uh, in Seattle and asked if we could borrow one of their boats. It was shipped over to Tokyo in three weeks. <clears throat> it was there when we arrived. We won all our races in that boat. We came back home. The boat eventually got back to Vancouver Harbor. And uh, we decided to take it down back to the university. But before we did, uh, we were a little bit cheeky. And we decided to paint a red maple leaf on the bow of the boat. And we put a gold chevron showing the gold medal so that our American pals would at least know that uh, we Canadians had done something really special. So we thought that was quite fun. Uh, we then drove around to the boat builder who happened to live in Seattle uh, and, and on the lake and was building these Pocock rowing shells, which were all the boats that were being built in the United States for the US Olympic team and colleges. So we told George Pocock our story quite happily that we had done this maple leaf and the gold chevron. And he sort of looked at us and said, do you know when I built that boat? And we said, no. And he said, I built that boat in 1956. And do you know, it's eight years old. Do you know who rode it in 1956? No. He said, two Americans won the gold medal in Melbourne in that pair or in 1956, you are the second gold medal pair that actually competed in that shell. And I thought, isn't that quite amazing? Uh, wow. Particularly in this day and age, when everything has to be brand new and everything has to be fiberglass or carbon fiber or whatever, uh, this good old rowing shell uh, actually did great service to both the Americans and Canadians. 
And actually the university donated the boat back to Vancouver. It's now sitting in the British Columbia Hall of Fame. Uh, so they returned it, uh, which was an incredible kindness. What an amazing story. So that that's that shell is is been served served to two Olympic medalists. That's fantastic. Right. Yeah. So uh, I'm I'm conscious of time, uh, but I do want to uh, ask you all to share one more favorite thing from 1964. And I've asked all of you to sort of identify one thing, physical thing, that uh, from the 1964 Tokyo Olympics that you could show us on screen. And then I may ask uh, uh, a few of you to, to talk about that. So can you, can you put up your memorabilia from those games? And then we'll, let's see what we see. So uh, there, Jim's showing up a ring and Maurice is showing a case. Oh, a bag from the US Olympic team. Uh, Ada showing something and, and, and uh, Yojiro-san showing a picture. Uh, Yojiro-san, why don't we start with you? Who, who's in the picture? Can you unmute Yojiro-san? Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> this picture was taken with Mr. Ichiro Hata. He is he is the uh, first president of, and founder of the Japanese Wrestling Federation. You were so young. <laughs> and also, uh, also. He is, he is a person who sent me to the Oklahoma State University. Yes, so Hatasan. I was, respect uh, him uh, very much. And this picture is uh, uh, Mr. Hatta celebrating me to win the Olympic. Right. And this is one of my. Uh, most important treasure in my whole life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey Jim, you showed us that ring. Can you can you give us a brief description of what what that ring represents to you? You're on mute, Jim. There you go. Yeah, I got it. Um, it's it's inscribed with USA. Uh, can you show it again? Sure. Olympics 1964, it has judo on the side of it. And uh, since I graduated from Jochi Daigaku or Sofia University in Tokyo, uh, they didn't have university rings. When I came back to the United States, I noticed all of the college graduates had university rings. So this is the equivalent of the university I graduated from the Olympics in 1964, <laughs> the culmination <laughs> of uh, 10 years of effort and uh, training in Japanese dojos and uh, traveling around the world to get to the Olympics. So Great. that's it. Thank you. Ada, what were you showing? I was showing. Very, very briefly. I want to get to a few more. Yeah. And these are the official stamps with all the beautiful stadiums on it. You know, the Olympic Stadium, the main stadium, and they were all given to us by the organizing committee. And it still shows in Japanese that I've been a participant of the Tokyo Olympic Games 1964. So, and also maybe that is for Jim, just to show you that I've been a very good friend of <laughs> you see, so we shared the stories there. Wonderful. But Thank also, you. And if we have time, Roy, quickly, very quickly, one of my main, main, main lovely memories is also due to the fact that all the medalists from Tokyo swimming, the team was sent on the first trip to Shinkansen, Tokyo to Kyoto. And we all rode for the first time a bullet train. We've never ever seen such such a fast train <laughs> in our lives. So we were very I, I'm going to have to cut you off because I just want to make sure I get to others. But I I, oh. I know. 
Okay, I you cut me off next time. Next time I tell you the story. And yes, yes. We all talk to ask, Tokyo. Because <laughs> talk about travel, I want to ask Mel about that bag he showed. What's that bag represent? This is uh, the bag in 1964 that they gave the uh, uh, athletes. Um, most of my uh, items and my uniforms, I donate them to Boys and Girls Club, Special Olympics, and some Hall of Fames. Uh, but this is, thing, this is the only thing I have. And I have a lot of pins. I have a, 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 a case of pins that I got from several uh, countries, but it's in a big frame and I didn't want to bring that out, it's too heavy. But uh, <laughs> this is the Olympic bag. They didn't give it, a clothes back then was, was, wasn't that very nice, made by C.S. Roebuck. And the clothes today, uh, you should see some of the things that kids are wearing today are beautiful clothing from some of the uh, finest uh, designers in this country and the world, especially this, this year had beautiful, beautiful clothing. I thought clothing was not that great. See his <laughs> robot. But you had a cowboy hat. And a cowboy hat, right. We did that, the president of the United States back then was Johnson, so we had a cowboy hat. I hated it, but we had to wear it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was amazing for, to put a cowboy hat on us, man. It was just too big. It was just ugly to me, but uh, I made the team, I wore it. That's good. How about you, Roger? What did you show? You're on mute. I picked this up in Tokyo and it's been sitting on my desk for 57 years containing a number of sort of private things that I wanted to keep in my, my own collection. So I, I don't have many objects of my sporting career in my house, but uh, even they're all stored away somewhere. But this I always have available, and it reminds me of my friendship with George Hungerford, my partner, which is Oh, I think we we lost we lost Roger. Uh, I'm sure we'll pick him right back up. Okay. Maurice, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Why don't we? Why don't we? When do we end this memorabilia show with you? What do you have to share? This is my Olympic bronze medal. That's lovely. With the the colors of of uh, Japanese silk. That's beautiful. The five the five colors representing the world of Olympiads. And that's my most precious moment, of course, because I, it was my dream to be in the Olympics and stand on a dais. And I finally got onto one and at least I received a medal. That's great. So I was told that we're going to extend by uh, about uh, 10, 15 more minutes. So uh, I apologize, apologize to Ada for cutting her off, but I will give her another chance to tell that story. Um, of course, anyone else who can stick around, please do. We still have a few more stories to tell. Um, I have this final question for all of you. What, what would you say to your 1964 self, if you could meet yourself when you were in Japan in 1964, after all of these years, what wisdom, what advice would you give to yourself today? So uh, we'll start with uh, Jim. Oh, I would tell that young man to listen to Sensei Mifune's advice. And what he said was, life is very similar to judo. All you have to do is get up just one more time than you've been thrown. Just keep getting up one more time than you've been thrown. And throughout life, I've been thrown a lot. And I have always thankfully gotten up. And that's what I would tell that young man. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Maurice, what advice would you have for yourself back in 64? I would just tell myself to uh, be very calm, uh, believe in myself more, 
and not to be overawed by the whole theatrical display, spectacular display, which was simply overpowering to me and hope that somehow I would perform better than that, that I did. You seem to perform pretty well. <laughs> Ada, how about yourself? What advice would you give to yourself? And if you want to complete your Shinkansen story, please do. <laughs> You're on mute. First of all, I agree with Jim, you know, if you get down, always get up. Be passionate about what you're doing. If you're not passionate, leave it. Just leave it because then it doesn't bring you anywhere. Also, trust the people. Trust the ethics. Be ethical. When you win, when you train, enjoy your victories to the utmost. Yeah, and also, doesn't matter how and where you are and what you do, always, always take care that your preference, perseverance, no, perseverance, yeah. Perse perseverance, yes. Is the main thing, is the main thing, because if you don't have the passion, if you don't have the per per <laughs> <laughs> perseverance, <laughs> yeah, then forget about it. And if you do so, you got so much in return. Everything you give is coming back to you in a thousand ways, in a thousand ways. And that is what Olympicism is about. You know, mm -hmm. so to give, share, be passionate, trust, sportivity, so much, so much. Mm -hmm. That is, that made me the person I am today, all together. So, and that is what I would love to give to all the other people who are doing sport. Thank you. How about you, Mel? What would you tell yourself? You're on mute. You hear me? Okay. Yes. I um, will tell myself that uh, not winning a gold medal in 1964, when I was laying on the ground, I, I thought about my grandfather and he said, always be the best. You have to be the best. Whatever you do in life, do it the best of your ability. And at age 27, I thought it was over for me because my age running 100 meters was not called. It wasn't something people just didn't do back then. But, and I, I, and I listened to those, his words in my mind and I said, watch my smoke. <laughs> I came back in 1968, first going to officer candidate school, getting commissioned as an officer of the United States Army, going to Vietnam, and being pulled out of Vietnam to train for the 68 games. And I thought about my grandfather again, never give up. I never gave up. And I wanted to win a gold medal. Some kind of way I was gonna get a model. If I had to steal it, I was gonna get a gold medal. <laughs> but I trained so hard and thinking about my grandfather and, and always he would say to me, listen, listen, he would say, listen. And he would say, be the best. You have to be the best male. And I trained so hard and after coming out of Vietnam in the jungles of fighting in the jungles of Vietnam and, and promised my, my athletes that, I mean, my, my soldiers, my, my men that I was in charge of, that I was gonna win the gold medal for them. And it happened. There is a God. I know there's a God because I prayed to come out and get out of Vietnam to come back. And at age 31, I never thought the military was gonna let me come back. And I came back and I showed the world how great I could be by working hard, never giving up, being the best that I could be. And I won that gold medal. Thank God. That is powerful. Thank you very much for sharing that. Yojiro-san, what would Hi. you, yes. would you, what advice would you yes. give to yourself uh, today? Oh, before that, before that, I'd like to say uh, thank you to Jim San. He told me, he told us, Anton Hasingson, great amateurism and uh, sportsmanship. Thank you very much. I remember that story. Yeah. Dori yeah. Kashimashite.
and I'm very proud. I'm very proud to be playing sports at that time, same time. I'm proud to be a uh, those days amateurism, great amateurism. Agreed. Finally, I like to say myself, hey, Yojo, hey, Yojo, you done it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's true. You. you can pat yourself on the back. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Roger, how about yourself? What would you say to yourself? Well, uh, a very similar comments to the others. I was... Um, a uh, student in uh, Toronto, which is many thousands of miles away from Vancouver and had never traveled west of Toronto uh, in my young life at that time. But I learned something. I was very, very lucky. I made a decision which uh, I think was really important. And that was when I decided that I'd like to try to make the Olympic team to go to Tokyo. I talked to my mother and she didn't have very much money at all, but she gave me a one-way ticket to Vancouver so that I could actually go and train. And it was probably the best moment for me because Vancouver was the center of literally world rowing at the time. They had won the only Olympic medal Canada won at the Rome Olympic Games in 1960. They won the only gold medal in the 1956 Olympic Games in Melbourne. It was a training program that we had to get up at 4.30 in the morning. We were on the water at 5.30 till seven. We worked or studied during the day. We trained at 5.30 at night. Uh, we had not a single day in months free. Uh, it was this incredible work ethic, incredible discipline. Uh, and I, I, I realize now that if you really want to be good, you've got to somehow manage in yourself to put yourself into the best possible, toughest possible environment and endure it in order to actually learn the perseverance and the courage and the, uh, the lack of desire to quit at any particular point in time. In every race at that level, I was frightened to death on the starting line of the next seven minutes of torture but I knew that if I had done the work, I could only hope to do the best that I could do, right? And uh, so that lesson that I would have told myself is, young man, put yourself in the toughest possible training environment and endure. And it's very similar to what Mel and the other stories have been, that people of perseverance, commitment, absolute dedication to something that you really believed in. And it goes back to Ada's view of passion absolute passion that you're willing to do all of that. Wow. Thank you very much for that. And thank you all. Perseverance, gratitude, passion, and joy. Uh, great messages to your former selves of 1964. And I want to I wanna, uh, thank you all for participating today. Before we say goodbye, I'd like to take a group shot to mark this great occasion, which means we take a screenshot of all of us. So I'm going to count to, to three, and then I'll say everyone smile and hold it for five seconds. Okay, ready? <laughs> One, two, three, smile. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to take a second shot. So if you could wave your hands for five seconds, not too fast, but wave your hands for about five seconds. Okay, we're good. Thank you all so much. And thank you for the panelists. It's really been a privilege to hear all of your stories. Thank you also to the global audience who have been listening. We hope you enjoyed this chance to learn about the 1964 Tokyo Olympics through the eyes of these truly great Olympians. And to Olympians in the audience, please check out the Oli House online. It's at olympians.org and leave your mark there to thank those making Tokyo 2020 a success. Uh, my best wishes from Tokyo. Goodbye to everybody. <laughs>